Hi there, I'm Dr. Trevor Cates. Welcome to the Spa Doctor Podcast. On today's podcast, we're talking about food and herbs for hormonal balance. My guest is Dr. Stephanie Zargalin. She is the Clinical Director of Lyme and Lotus Healing Arts Center in Charleston, South Carolina. Her private practice is centered on functional endocrinology, lifestyle modification, and whole food supplementation. Her expertise includes functionally evaluating thyroid, adrenal, male and female hormone imbalances, and and digestion. Her mission is to empower women on how they can transform their lives and incorporate nutrition, supplements, and positive lifestyle choices. She's written for national publications such as Chiropractic Economics, National Awakenings, and Nutrition Perspectives. Today's interview focuses on women's health and hormones and which foods, nutrients, and herbs are helpful for adrenal, thyroid, and sex hormone balance. So please enjoy this interview. Stephanie, welcome to the Spot Doctor podcast. It's great to have you on. Thank you so much, Trevor. It's so nice to be here. Thanks for having me. Yeah, so today we're talking about women's health, women's hormones, and foods, herbs, things that help support our hormonal balance. And so what? first of all, before we dive into the material today, Tell us what, what got you so interested in working with women's health in your practice? That is a great question because I've been there. Um, it was a really big challenge going through school for myself. Um, at the time I was in chiropractic school. It was four years of going to school, 40 hours a week. I was also working at a restaurant on the side for 20 hours a week. I was studying for boards, getting ready to graduate, getting ready to move across the country, get married, start a practice, you name it. And I was pretty darn stressed out, if you can imagine all those things going on in my life at that particular time. And I started waking up with hot sweats and night, or night flashes, night sweats and hot flashes, but both. And I would literally be drenched in sweat. And at 24 years old, I was just thinking, this is not okay. Um, so I went the regular route of, you know, going to the gynecologist, having the labs done, and they told me everything was normal. And then when we looked at my cycle, my cycle was very um, unregulated as well. I had a very heavy cycle, uh, lots of cramps, lots of sitting in bed during that time. Um, I got to the point where I was having nausea and vomiting every single month. So basically my period was ruling my life and I didn't want that anymore for myself. Um, so once I had the test done, the doctor said everything was normal. I said, this absolutely is not normal. So that really started me on a, a track to find out really what's going on? How, how can the lab say I'm normal, but I'm really feeling this way? There's, there's no way. And that's when I got more into functional medicine, really looking at different labs to do for women. And I did some functional labs on myself. And I found out that I was a hot mess. Um, my cortisol was really high. My estrogen was high. My progesterone was low. I had higher testosterone than normal. And from there, I was able to look at ways to balance that naturally. And it took me about a year to fix myself, but um, I'm happy to say now I need an app to know when my cycle's coming. It's much more pleasant to deal with, and, and now my period doesn't ruin and rule my life. And that's really what got me on the mission to help women and educate them and empower them on different options, different choices, and in ways that we can start balancing things naturally. Um, so that's the story, and that's, that's why we're here today. <laughs> Yeah, and so many of us have our own personal journey that leads us to, into specializing in a certain area. Um, so, so I uh, can definitely understand. And then also, I think so often it's confusing for women that are told your hormones are fine, there's nothing wrong with you. It yes. must be in your head, here's a sleep med, here's an antidepressant, you'll be fine, you're just getting older. I mean, at 24, of course, that's not exactly... <laughs> what you were told, but I think a lot of women are, they're told, you know, it's just, you know, it's just part of being a woman or, you know, this is, you've just been dealt a bad hand. I'm sorry, but your labs are fine. You're, there's really nothing wrong with you. Mm -hmm. um, and that's a really frustrating place to be because like you said, it's like, there, no, there, there is something wrong here. I know there's something wrong. And for, you know, when you're told, no, you're fine, you're normal. Um, you're like, no, it's not right. <laughs> Yes. Yeah, so as women, I think we're very intuitive creatures anyway. We just feel that something is off. And then you mentioned, you know, being given sleep meds or prescribed antidepressants. I can't tell you how many women have gone through that route that I've seen personally that have said, you know, I know something's off. The one thing they gave me was an antidepressant that didn't feel right to me. And that's not what I wanted to, to take. And like I said, once we can really get some 
solid lab work for these women, we really find a lot of, a lot of things that, that can be out of balance with them. Yeah. So what do you, what do you feel like the gaps are um, right now with, with women being treated with, um, with health plans and things? What are some of the gaps you feel are going, or, that are happening? I think some of the biggest gaps are really in testing. Um, we're not doing functional testing. We're looking to see if women have maybe fibroids or endometriosis or polycystic ovarian disease. And some women don't have the diseases at this point, but they still have imbalances. And so I think that's where we're missing. I, I call it the gray area. You know, you may not have a disease yet, but you have a lot of symptoms that are, that are moving in that direction. And I'd much rather get a woman when she is, is out of balance, but not completely broken yet um, and, and really work on it from, from that perspective too, because there's so much we can do um, prior to that point. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and so with these, especially lab testing, this is not something that most, well, at least not conventional doctors are running. This is something that functional medicine doctors as well as naturopathic doctors are, are ordering. And can you say anything about the labs that you like to, I mean, you don't have to mention names of labs or if, unless you want to, but um, just, you know, what are you kind of looking for in your practice that you can mm -hmm. tell that really helps? Yeah, I'm really looking at so just the women's cycle. So if, if it's a woman that are, still has a period in menstrual cycle every month, I want to see that entire cycle throughout an entire month. You know, we go and get lab work done just on one day. We're only seeing a very small shot of what her hormones look like. But there's this beautiful dance of the hormones with your estrogens, the progesterone, the testosterone. And if we can do labs that track the entire month, we can really see exactly where there might be a problem in that woman's cycle. Because she might be good at the beginning of the cycle, but come ovulation to the time her menstrual cycle starts again, it's, it's, it's a total mess. So with those kind of labs, um, if you're having a menstrual cycle and you're, and you're seeking out someone to find some help, really look for someone that can do a full month cycle. So that's one piece of the puzzle. Um, the other thing I think we're lacking of, of testing, just in medicine in general, is looking at our adrenal glands. Our adrenal glands are producing cortisol. Women these days, we're doing so much. I mean, we are powerful, amazing creatures, but we're also really pushing ourselves and sometimes not taking enough time. So I really find with a lot of women, their cortisol levels are off, their DHEA levels are off. So I'm testing those types of hormones a lot for them as well. Mm -hmm. Okay, so you, you do the testing and there a combination, sounds like a blood or a saliva, maybe some mm -hmm. urine tests, a different, different tests that you run, yeah. And I'm typically doing um, blood and saliva, most, most commonly with women. Um, we'll do some stool samples when we need to, but that's generally not the case for everybody. Yeah, yeah, okay. Um, and, and so, you know, I, I think what you know, we're talking about here is that different, different tests require different, different uh, you know, routes of, 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 of testing for them. Some is blood, some is saliva, some is urine. You learn different things in different places. For adrenals, the best place is saliva, right? Check. Yes, I, I love the saliva testing for the adrenals because really when we're looking at cortisol levels, that's usually where it starts for a lot of women with, with imbalancing their hormones. Um, they get stressed out, cortisol levels go high, and if they're stressed out long term, we can really track that. Um, cortisol is one of those hormones that has a nice rhythm daily. So it should go high in the morning. That's the, the hormone that helps you wake you up, get you out of bed, get you going for the day, and then it should start trickling down throughout the day and be lowest at night. So I love the saliva panels that will do all day testing because then you can see, well, what is my total output of cortisol for the entire day? Is it good in the morning? Is it really bad at night? You know, I've got some of my patients, I call them the, the tired and wired patients where their cortisol should be dropping at night, but they shoot back up again. Um, so we can really see that on lab testing it. And based on what the labs say, we can then really give some specific um, either timing for some prescriptions that we want to do as far as herbs or eating certain foods, or we will know if we need to raise or lower certain hormones. Because so many times we might have a hormone that's high or low, but it still gives the same symptoms. So just because someone tells me what their symptoms are, um, I can't necessarily tell them what hormones are necessarily out of balance due to that. Okay, so let's talk about this. So, um, I think, you know, when we're talking about hormones, we're talking about not just sex hormones, we're talking about like you were talking cortisol, adrenals, we're talking about thyroid, we're, we're talking about these are the most common things that we talk about in practice, right? Uh, mm -hmm. So let's talk about some of these because I want to talk about food because food is such powerful medicine. And I think it oftentimes gets overlooked. A lot of times women are like, okay, well, do I need to go on hormones? And I'm like, well, hold on, before you even talk about hormone therapy and if that's even necessary, let's talk about what you can be doing at home every day because your choices that you make every day 
are so powerful and food is powerful medicine. So when it comes to, let's talk about adrenals first and things like cortisol. Um, what are some of the, 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 the foods that are really beneficial for helping with um, adrenals? Yeah, I think the adrenals are definitely the place to start because if those are out of balance, that really does give a trickle down effect to a lot of the other hormones and, and even the thyroid gland. Um, so my favorite, I guess, tips to give ladies that are working with their adrenals, um, getting enough protein. So making sure that each meal that you have is a, is a good, we have fat, we have protein, we have carbohydrates, but the adrenals really, really thrive on, on protein. Um, and one of the signs that your adrenals might not be working to their, their, their speed and to their efficiency is if you crave salt a lot. Um, that's one of the hormones we need a lot of salt to push those pathways. So women that crave salt or maybe just want to go straight for the, the salty foods, the potato chips, um, we can look at the adrenal glands. So really looking at making sure that we're adding good salt. So if we're eating really clean foods, if we're eating um, not processed foods, we really do need to add some good sea salts to the diet. So making sure we've added that. And then as far as nutrients go that are going to help with the adrenal glands, um, your, your B vitamins, your C vitamins, and selenium, I think are the most important. Um, so the way that we can do that very easily on a daily basis is for the B vitamins, just one good hearty cup of greens per day. So whether you throw in your smoothie, whether you have a nice big green salad, um, steam some veggies for dinner, that's, that's how we can get that in. Um, for the vitamin C, one citrus fruit per day. That's it. So even just drinking water and squeezing lemon or lime into your water throughout the day would be perfect. Um, one thing that I love to eat is mushrooms. They're high in vitamin C as well. And then for selenium, um, nuts, seeds, fish, but if we wanna get our daily dose in the most efficient power pack, um, it's Brazil nuts. So two Brazil nuts a day is the daily dose just to get the selenium in. So those are really easy ways that we can add these foods in to really start affecting on a daily basis. And if you are just to add these foods and keep just doing it day after day, you will, you will see the change, yeah. And I, and I want to remind everybody, because I, I talk a lot about skin on the podcast, is that, that my specialty, and I, I want to remind you, these are all important for skin. These are all, I mean, first of all, cortisol, balancing cortisol and, again, and, and having healthy adrenals is important for healthy skin, especially skin inflammation issues, inflammatory skin issues. Um, balancing cortisol is really key in helping with managing those and B vitamins, uh, vitamin C, selenium, those are all crucial for skin health as well. And the, the right kinds of protein. So when you talk about protein, what, what is a, what are good sources of protein and, and your, in, from your perspective? Yeah. Um, we can obviously do meats. So, um, chicken, fish, and when we talk about meats, I really encourage my women, especially when they have hormonal issues, to eat clean sources of meat. I um, mean, you know, if we're gonna do beef or any kind of um, that meat, I really want to make sure it's organic, we don't have hormones in the meat because that can exacerbate some of our other issues. So really eating clean types of meat. If we're gonna do fish, we're doing wild fish and not farm raised. And then we can look at um, nuts, seeds, legumes, our beans, chickpeas, hummus, you know, all those are going to be high in, in protein. We even have veggies that are high in protein. I mean, broccoli is a great vegetable that has a higher content of, of protein as well. Okay, great. It's also a good source of vitamin C too. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Okay, great. Um, and so that is with just kind of overall adrenal support, keeping the adrenal balance, not one direction or the other. Um, right. And so what about herbs for, um, are there any herbs that are particularly good for that you'd recommend for adrenals? Yes. yes. I love the adrenals. There are so many fantastic herbs for them. And a lot of the herbs for the adrenals are what are called adaptogenic herbs. So what those are, are those are herbs that you can take and whether or not your body needs to raise cortisol or lower it, the body will do what it needs to do with that particular herb. Uh, one of my favorites is ashwagandha. It's also called withania. So that's a fantastic herb that's a great adaptogen that can help raise or lower cortisol, whatever needs to happen. Um, I love that herb specifically for women that are the, the tired and wires that we were talking about earlier. Those of women that are maybe tired in the morning, they might get a second wind at night and they can't go to sleep or they have sleep issues. Um, withania ashwagandha is a great herb for that. Um, I also love the herb of rhodiola. That is a fantastic herb for getting you going in the morning. So if you're the one that, that needs those three cups of coffee, I'd rather cut down on the coffee and move more towards, you know, certain herbs like rhodiola. Ginseng is also another great herb. Uh, Ulithro is fantastic. Licorice is great, a great adaptogenic herb as well. So we have so many great ones to choose from. So whether you do it in an herb form, a pill form, or a tincture, or even doing a tea, 
um, all those can be effective at, at helping restore the adrenal glands. Okay, great. Um, all right, well, let's talk about let's talk about thyroid. Um, and you know, actually, before I move on, you know, it's really interesting. When I was creating my skincare line, I actually used put some adaptogenic uh, adaptogenic herbs in the skincare products because our skin gets stressed. And yes. adaptogenic herbs, and there's actually HPA access on the skin, and so we believe that it has a balancing effect on the skin. So when your skin's stressed, it needs a little support <laughs> too. <laughs> it does, and that's probably where it's going to show up first is your skin, hair, and nails, because as far as the body's concerned, it's going to make sure that you're breathing, that you're digesting, and that your heart's still beating. Uh, you know, the things we'll see first is in, in your skin, so that makes perfect sense. Yeah, right. Yeah. So, all right, let's talk about thyroid. So, what are some some good foods for helping um, balance thyroid? Yeah, for the thyroid, we once again need some selenium. Um, we also need vitamin E, vitamin D, and iodine for a lot of people. So those are, are what's lacking in a lot of our patients as far as being able to create the thyroid hormones. But even more importantly, I think for thyroid gland is really looking at how well their liver is working because a lot of the hormones that we need that are active for the thyroid really aren't made in the thyroid, they're made in the liver. So we shuttle those hormones from the thyroid to the liver. We need to reactivate them in the liver. So if you have a really sluggish liver or you're really eating poorly or maybe taking a lot of medications, that can slow down the body's processing ability to create those hormones. Um, so really looking at, are we eating enough good liver support foods too? Um, so liver support foods are gonna be things like your cruciferous vegetables, your broccoli, your cauliflower, your Brussels sprouts, your kale. Once again, all good foods for your skin. Um, Avocados are great, so lemons, ginger, turmeric, um, you, you know, all those anti-inflammatory herbs. Beets are fantastic, uh, globe artichoke. So hopefully most of your listeners like a few of those and can start incorporating those. So that will help the liver processing. And then as far as vitamin D, you know, getting out in a little bit of sun, a little bit of sunshine, but of course using sunscreen where necessary. Um, cod liver oil is great for your vitamin A and vitamin D. We already talked about the selenium, but those would be some of the foods that we can start incorporating as far as the thyroid goes. And then for iodine, um, one food that we really don't eat a lot of as Americans is seaweed. Um, that has a lot of iodine in it that can be really helpful for the thyroid as well. Mm -hmm. Right. And of course, if anybody's listening, watching, and, and you have uh, your under treatment for a thyroid kiss or any of these hormonal condi conditions, talk to your doctor about, you know, what's best for you as far as the foods and how to prepare them. And I think that, you know, for example, if someone has, uh, um, you know, they might want to be avoiding uh, the raw forms of these or eating those and mm -hmm. limitations, yeah. they might want to have steam versions of some of the cruciferous vegetables for some, some people with thyroid problems, right? So yes, yes. I'm definitely recommending my hypothyroids eat them cooked and my hypers eat them raw. So it really just depends on, on what your labs look like uh, working with, your doctor um, to get the right levels, especially iodine too. You definitely want to be within the right limits and right levels for that as well. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, great. And what about herbs? Herbs for the thyroid gland? Um, I love bladderwrack, um, but that's only if you're hypo. That wouldn't be one to take for the, the hyper side, um, but there's good herbs for that. And really all thyroid cases are also adrenal cases. I've never met a thyroid patient that didn't also have some adrenal um, issues as well. So I think that it probably starts with the thyroid gland or the uh, adrenal gland and then that then trickles down to, to the mess or, or make uh, make the thyroid gland work not as efficiently. So all of my thyroid patients, we also work on the adrenal glands as well. So using some of those other herbs, the Wadania, the ashwagandha, the licorice, um, whatever that patient might need based on their lab work, we, we kind of create a protocol that will include some adrenal support as well for them. Okay, perfect. Okay, so when we talk about sex hormones, there's a some different ones and we don't just yes. have one. really you know, it's the same for for the other glands too to a certain extent but when we're talking about sex hormones they get a little bit more complicated but well mm -hmm. let's hit on some of the you know the, like the some of the big ones you know estrogen progesterone for women it, what do we do for balancing those as well as testosterone and um i'm always surprised that even though i say this all the time you know, women have testosterone too someone's always like what we have testosterone <laughs> that yes. Just um yes we need but not to the same extent but um the, and of course there are some foods that we can eat with helping with um with the sex hormones right yes and as far as the female hormones go if we're looking at raising estrogen levels obviously we have all of our phytoestrogens the soys the wild yams um, those kind of foods. 
So that will help from a food perspective, but if we're really looking at herbs, um, maybe you're moving into perimenopause, maybe starting to get some hot flashes, some night sweats, a little fatigue. Um, I love wild yam for that. That's my first go-to for a lot of my women um, with hot flashes and night sweats. I've also found that as long as they don't have a thyroid issue, a lot of women are low in iodine and adding supplementing iodine, low amounts of iodine with the, the wild yam or black co-wash really does help balance out those hot flashes for them. Um, so that's been one of my magic tips uh, with the ladies to really help get them sleeping better because if they're not sleeping well, then they're tired the next day and then that whole cascade of fatigue starts. Um, if you have a cycle still, we're looking at maybe, you know, we've got too much estrogen and we need to balance out progesterone. I love Chase Creek for that. Um, the Vitex is, is fantastic, also called Chase, Chase Creek, uh, for balancing out progesterone levels. And not only does it help balance progesterone levels, but it also helps with melatonin production. So ladies that are having issues with sleeping, I will always recommend that they take their chase tree at night just so we can get maybe a better, better night's sleep. And then if we're moving into menopause, um, one of my favorite herbs for ladies is tribulus. It's one that we don't talk about as often, but it is fantastic for increasing our estrogen levels. Um, sometimes DHEA starts dropping as we age as well. So really helping with stamina, with energy for women that are postmenopausal. And yes, we do have testosterone as ladies, and sometimes some of the ladies have too much. Um, so if we need a lower testosterone for them, um, white peony is my favorite herb for that. So women that have PCOS issues, too much testosterone, um, maybe they're starting to have some hairs where they don't want it. So typically what happens is hair leaves where they want it and shows up where they don't want it, right? Um, but white peony really can help with the balance of the testosterone with that as well. Mm -hmm. And what about foods? Are there any foods that you recommend with for hormone balance, uh, sex hormone balance? Yeah, the biggest thing for foods is really just eating a clean diet. Um, I think probably taking away more of the triggers are probably a, a better choice or better place to start. Really limiting alcohol, um, limiting sugar, because as you know, with too much sugar, we get systemic inflammation. That creates havoc on our body's ability to make our hormones and then really looking at stress levels as well, because we see this cascade of when, when we get stressed, when our cortisol goes high, that kicks our estrogen into gear, that messes with our insulin level, that depresses our thyroid gland. So really coming back to eating as anti-inflammatory as possible. So trying to avoid a lot of the, the processed packaged foods, just eating cleanly, um, eating real food. You know, if it came out of the ground or, or you know, fell from, from a tree, um, eat it. And really avoiding a lot of the... Um, grains, the inflammatory foods, and going more with fish, chicken, um, those kind of things will be helpful as well. Right. Okay. And then when we, when we look at the liver and the liver's function too, you mentioned that already, but I, you know, of course that plays a yes. role in these hormones too and, and making sure that the liver is functioning properly, right? Yes. I think that's a huge role just because if we have to, not only do we process thyroid hormones in the liver, we also have to process our estrogen in the liver. So if we don't have really healthy livers, we tend to keep estrogen recirculating. And so I think this is probably one of the issues we have as ladies in America with having too much estrogen compared to our progesterone levels. So really looking at how can we keep the liver clean? Um, how can we just make it work more efficiently? So the beets, the globartichokes, um, all those fruits and fruits and vegetables are all going to be helpful. And even getting just fruits and vegetables in general with the fiber are going to help conjugate those estrogens and, and allow us to be able to excrete them out through for our digestive tract. Right, right. Because there's there's this feedback mechanism that happens in the body. And if it's not, they're not breaking down properly. That the whole feedback mechanism doesn't work properly. And then your body gets confused. And maybe you're in a time when your body's already confused, like, what's right. happening here? Um, and then compound that, but add on top of that, all of the hormone disrupting chemicals that we're exposed to in the yes. environment, um, including skincare products, that's just going to make it even more challenging for the liver. So, um, as I, I always, you know, I always like to go back to the liver and then really emphasizing that when we're talking about foods and herbs and hormone balance, right? Yeah, and so many women that come in with maybe you know ten different things going on. They've got like, hormone issues, they have thyroid issues, they have adrenal issues, they have gut issues. Um, I always need to start with the foundation because if we just dive right in and start working with female hormones, we may not be as successful with our, our protocols. You know, if, if we can make sure that the liver is functioning correctly, that the gut is working right, then I know that by the time we get to working on her hormones and balancing that, it's going to be so much easier and quicker for, for that woman. So in so many cases, I'm really starting with, with gut, with digestion, 
uh, maybe some gut flora issues with, with those with those women, um, and go on from there. And I know you mentioned the skincare products, and what else is out there as far as estrogen goes? That's huge right now because it's not only skincare products; it's um, you know anything that we're putting on our bodies that have extra estrogen. So if we're not eating organic fruits and vegetables, if we're eating meats that have hormones in them, if we're using Roundup at our house or having bug spray. You know, all that compounds, I think, with, with creating this, this perfect storm, if you will, as far as hormone imbalance goes. Mm, yeah, it's true. And, it, you know, it's, it, we don't want to wait until menopause, perimenopause for paying attention to these things. The, the sooner we can start this, the better. And I, I know sometimes it's, it's tempting uh, for, for our human nature, I think, is unless it's broken, you know, we're not going to really think about addressing it, but the sooner I think, um, we can do that. And, 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 uh, it was unfortunate that at a young age you had these, these health challenges, but at least it made you pay attention early on because I'm sure that you see in your practice, these patterns of women, um, maybe they go through their twenties and they have certain symptoms and issues. Maybe they go and, and they're treated maybe conventionally or they're put on birth control pills or something and they, they get kind of like, maybe they're not having symptoms and then they start to go through menopause and all of that comes back, right? That it, yes. if they didn't address it earlier on, then it just gets worse. So the sooner, you know, we see these patterns of the hormone imbalances, the sooner we can, we address those, the better, right? Don't, we, don't you see that in your practice? Absolutely. And I, I think some of the patterns that we're seeing with younger women now is patterns of more chronic fatigue, patterns of sleep disturbances, uh, patterns of unexplained weight gain where they can't lose it no matter what they do. And also patterns of they're thinking that they're going through menopause. They'll lose their periods for four, five, six months in their 30s now. Um, and the way that I explain that to them is your adrenals are so stressed out, everything's just kind of shut down for a bit. Um, you know, it's not their time yet to, to go into menopause in their mid to late thirties, but their body just can't do it anymore. And it's really interesting because once we can start get the gut working right, once we can start um, supporting the adrenal glands, their, their periods almost always come back. So it's, it's not physiologically, you know, for us to, to go in menopause in our thirties, but when the body's so stressed out, it's going to conserve energy any way that it can. And that's usually one of the ways. Yeah. So what are, um, what are some things to maybe like talking about the different ages that depending upon where someone is coming in, like a woman is, is paying, you know, where she is right now, what are some of the things that people, where places people can start to, um, to start making some changes? Yeah, I, I think at any age, really just cleaning up our diets would be good. Clean up our diets, clean up our toiletry items, clean up our personal care products. That can be done at any age. And it's going to be helpful no matter if you're in your 20s, 30s, 40s, 50s. Um, but if you're in your 20s, really looking at, you know, do you want to have children one day? So really looking at, is my is my cycle regular? Is Am I balanced? Maybe doing some preconception care, not only for you, but also your husband or partner. Um, because the men are definitely involved in this as well these days. Uh, when you're moving into your 30s, you know, we do see a lot of period changes for some ladies. It starts getting a little different. So if you've noticed that your period has become more... Um, lengthier, um, heavier, any of those kind of things. Those are some of the symptoms to really look out for. So once again, the, the prescription would be the same as far as the diet goes, you know, eating clean, eating lots of fruits and vegetables, getting enough fiber. Um, but I just want to impress upon people that just because we're getting older um, doesn't mean these things should necessarily be happening. So just kind of being on the lookout for that. Um, you know, if you feel like you want some testing done, find someone that does some more functional testing and get your numbers looked at at that age. And if you still have a cycle, once again, doing a test that's going to include a whole month. So you really see the estrogen and progesterone dance throughout the month and really see what's going on. Um, as we're moving into our 40s and 50s, things start slowing down. Um, I tell women, just like, you know, puberty didn't happen overnight. Uh, menopause does not happen overnight either. You know, it's usually a two to eight year process. Some of my ladies don't like to hear that. Um, but the whole point, too, is not that we take away every single symptom that they're having necessarily. But if your symptoms are to the point where it's really affecting your daily life, where you can't sleep, where you have no energy, that's when there's something that's possibly out of balance that you might want to get looked at. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, and I know that one thing that comes up, um, you know, uh, before menopause is birth control. And um, I've had uh, Dr. Jolene Brighton talking about birth control syndrome on and uh, talking about 
uh, alternatives to birth control pills. And so, and do you have any thoughts on, because I know that's always a big yes. thing <laughs> before hitting menopause. I mean, even, even women in their forties, right. Um, we're, you know, done having children, but there's still a possibility. And you know, right. so, you know, but certainly when you're in your twenties, uh, you're trying to get, go, you know, go to college and you start, you start your life. So timing is always an interesting thing with that. Yes, so, it is. Um, any suggestions, um, any thoughts on birth control? Yeah, I think that if you are taking birth control, it's really important to replace the nutrients that birth control is taking out. So I think that's one thing that that's not really discussed very much when the gynecologist hands you the prescription. But a lot of our B vitamins are depleted, a lot of our minerals, selenium. It's very interesting because the the nutrients that are depleted with birth control are all nutrients that are needed for adrenal gland support. So once again, putting those back into the body if you're going to take birth control. If you're wanting to get off birth control or a patient from birth control, I would always ask why. Is this really for birth control purposes? Is it really to control your cycle? Um, so we kind of work on the why. So if it's due to controlling the cycle, then we work on balancing our cycle. If it's due to I don't want to have a baby, then we work on um, teaching people natural family planning. Because I'm always happy to teach all of my patients um, natural family planning methods. Okay, excellent. All right. Well, thank you so much for the information. Tell everybody where they can find you. Yes, the quickest and easiest way to find me is probably my website. Um, it is drzagragan.com. And there you can get more information on me, um, look at what we've, been, what we've got going on. Um, we have different programs online that, that, that we can look at that um, would be great for your viewers. So yes, I'd be happy to continue the conversation online or on social media. Okay, great. Thanks again for coming on and sharing with us all kinds of information and tips on, on hormone balance. Thanks so much, Trevor. I appreciate it. I hope you enjoyed this interview today with Dr. Stephanie, and you got some great tips on how to practically start balancing your hormones, things that you could be doing with your foods, your lifestyle, start doing today. Now, if you do believe that you have hormonal imbalances that are impacting, that you have symptoms and you're, it's impacting your health, I do recommend seeing a functional medicine or naturopathic medicine doctor who can really test and get to the root cause and help support you in a treatment plan. But the tips today should be able to help you on some mo diet modifications and some lifestyle things that you could start doing today to help with hormonal healthy hormones and hormonal balance. To learn more about Dr. Stephanie, you could go to thespadoctor.com, go to the podcast page with her interview, and you can find her her website there and some tips and tools that she's got to help with to help you with your hormones. Also, while you're there on the Spa Doctor website, I invite you to join the Spa Doctor community so you don't miss any of our upcoming shows and you can get some valuable tips and resources from us as well. And if you haven't taken the skin quiz, I invite you to do that. Just go to theskinquiz.com. Find out what messages your skin's trying to tell you about your health that might include your hormones. You can go to theskinquiz.com to find that out. And I also invite you to join me on social media, on Facebook, Twitter, Twitter, Instagram, Pinterest, and YouTube. And I'll see you next time on the Spot Doctor Podcast.